to stay recording. Okay. Uh, thanks everyone for tuning in. Uh, my name is Eric Obanoff and I'm with $2 Radio headquarters here in Columbus, Ohio. And we have the distinct privilege of hosting this special conversation tonight uh, between Jessica Luther and Kavitha Davidson, the co-authors of the brand spanking new book, Loving Sports When They Don't Love You Back which just came out from the University of Texas Press. And we were just talking about how gorgeous the design was and the attention to detail with the, the, the material the book was made out of. Um, but uh, Jessica and Kavitha are joined in, gonna be joined in conversation uh, with Hanif Abdurraki, who says of the book, I am thankful for this text as a reminder among a great many other things that affection can come with a responsibility. Luther and Davidson thoughtfully reckoned with sports and their long history of inequity, seeking accountability without dimming the impact that sports have had on their lives and many lives beyond theirs. This is a generous book, one that I will sit with for years to come. Um, the book has gotten really tremendous early coverage too. I saw the great starred review from Kirkus and Publishers Weekly had glowing things to say, as did the Bob Costas, which is pretty cool. Um, Jessica is a freelance journalist whose work has appeared in Sports Illustrated, ESPN the Magazine, the New York Times Magazine, and is the author of Unsportsmanlike Conduct, College Football and the Politics of Radio, and has written extensively on the intersection of sports and violence off the field. Kavitha A. Davidson is a sports writer and host of The Lead, an in-depth daily sports news podcast produced by The Athletic. She's on the board of directors of the Yogi Berra Museum and Learning Center and was a writer with ESPNW and ESPN The Magazine and a sports columnist at Bloomberg covering the intersection of sports and society, culture, politics, race, gender, and business. Um, for anyone who's interested in picking up a copy of the book, we do have them available for order at our website, which is $2RadioHQ.com, just all spelled out. Uh, and uh, I'd also, you know, just encourage anyone to pick it up from their, their favorite local independent bookshop. So I'm going to be quiet now and turn things over to Hanif uh, and Jessica and Kavitha. Congratulations on the book. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Eric. Um, yeah, congratulations on the book, y'all. It's a... Uh, you know, I think it's probably an interesting time to have a book uh, come out. And um, I've been excited to see how warmly the book has been received. And I also think that, of course, in some ways, I imagine unintentionally, the book is coming at a really interesting time because um, at least where I am and Jessica, I imagine where you are, because you're in Austin, um, there is a lot of... Um, kind of, and I know Austin's is different than Columbus's. There's a lot of anxiety around college football right now. Um, so much so that in Columbus, there are people who kind of like have decided to protest by um, merely like putting on OSU clothes and going to just like yell at the horseshoe, um, to yell at the structure, <laughs> um, as if the yelling will, as if a season will emerge from the horseshoe's bells. Um, but that's kind of the first thing I was interested in was, was getting a feel for um, what both of your temperature is on, on sports right now. Um, not just on the consumption of sports right now, but also um, how sports has become kind of this um, even more of a lightning rod than ever, perhaps because of the dual, this intersection of both the pandemic and the forever racism. Yeah, it's interesting because you don't have football, whereas I am here in Austin where they're going to put, they say, 25,000 people in a stadium sometime soon, which just seems wild. So I'm sure we're having very different community reactions to that. But yeah, sport right now, I certainly am a conflicted consumer in this moment. The book in general is really, it's really weird to us that it's hitting at this point in time because we had a pure panic moment back in March before, right before it went to print, correct? Like it was about to go off where we could no longer do anything with the book. And 
it was like we had an emergency meeting the day after the NBA shut down. And it was like, who cares about any of this stuff right now? Like, will anyone care at all at, at the point that the book comes out? We didn't know like how much death there would be around all of this. Of course, we had no anticipation of everything that's happened since the murder of George Floyd. So, oh man, it's so strange that it's hitting at a time where it actually feels incredibly relevant because of how fearful we were uh, that it would be a sideshow to something much more important. And then, and, it, and as you said, it's become the center of so many things from the wildcat strikes that we saw for a couple of days. When was that? Two was that two weeks ago? I have no sense of time anymore. Uh, <laughs> that seems right. And then tomorrow, the NFL says they're returning. I, I assume they will because they're the NFL. So um, that should be interesting. And then at the same time, this is like a thing in the presidential election. Like one of the hot but button topics in politics, like capital P politics, right now is is sports and so it all feels super important and at the same time i still feel like we shouldn't be having them at all right now even as i'm totally watching the u.s open in the same fashion that i did a year ago right. yeah i think that that's i mean that's pretty much where where i stand as well when when sports came back um I, neither Jessica nor I felt good about that fact, right? Like, I think we were both very skeptical about the NWSL bubble and then the NBA bubble and the WNBA bubble. Thankfully, they have worked. Um, but, you know, I still feel extremely conflicted about baseball. Like Jessica said, the NFL is coming back tomorrow with no bubble plan. They're just going to play kind of, they're, they're kind of going about business as usual. And, you know, you talk about 25,000 fans being in the stands for college football. There are also NFL teams that will allow fans in the stands, even as cheerleaders and mascots have been banned. Like, like they're like, I, I feel so many, I still don't feel good about the fact that sports are being played right now, but I feel really good watching them. And that's like, that's the in entire dilemma that we are trying to get at in the book. And it is weird to think about how a global pandemic that the United States has not handled particularly well has created the exact like criteria and conditions under which we wrote this whole book because we did really have this panic moment. Um, and then all of the things that have ensued since March have just highlighted um, some, some of the issues that we've talked about here. So I think that, you know, I, I wrote several years ago and we quote a piece that I wrote for ESPN where I said, sports have always been political. And I stand by that. I truly believe that. Um, and I think that it, it takes some of these hallmark things, a pandemic, um, a, a, a national uprising over racial justice, um, you know, all, all a, 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 a national uprising over sexual harassment and, 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 and uh, you know, violence in the workplace and things like that to bring some of the ways that sports intersect with these things to light. But sports really are just a lens through which we are viewing all of these things because nothing that we discuss in the book isn't something that is happening in broader society. With so there's something that I've been really running up against, um, and it is the American rush to return to this idea of normalcy, quote unquote normalcy. And it appeared to me very early on that sports is going to be a tool in that, like sports was going to be the thing that kind of attempted to open up these pathways. Mm -hmm. um, what is it about sports? For me, you know, I've been struggling to watch sports. I, I did enjoy watching the NWSL. Um, but there has been something about, I mean, I'm a huge basketball fan, you know, but there's been something about watching both the WNBA and the NBA that has made it, I'm so much more aware that they're in a bubble, just like mm -hmm. aesthetically. Uh, and just like visually, I'm very, you're very aware of it when you see like the interviewers, not just with masks on, but with like the long mics and the players with the, and so it's just like, I cannot as much as I resist and try to resist the idea of sports as escape, does it, is that an unavoidable thing? I mean, it's, it, is it, what makes it so that sports can build this bridge back to a normalcy, even if people don't want a return to normalcy? That's a really good question, man. Uh, 
Oh, what is it about sports? That's a great question. I think we have an entire narrative with sports in this idea or myth of sports that it's unifying. And I have a lot of trouble with this. We've talked about this on Burn It All Down before, um, the podcast I co-host, that for lots of reasons, we say that sports unifies in ways that it totally, there's no actual unity going on. And so I wonder if that's part of it, that the normalcy is like, we're all coming together and this community that we create around sport and somehow that makes us all feel connected and all these warm things. I don't know, maybe because we just have a general idea that sports is escapism, right? This whole idea of stick to sports and all that stuff. The baseline idea is that you can escape when you're watching sports um, and you don't know the outcomes. So there is fun to it in a way that not, it's not the same thing as watching a movie or some other kind of pop culture. There is the randomness of it. But man, I don't know, Hanif, I actually, what is it? Why, why is this the thing that we decided is how we just define normal? And I think whatever that is, that is the huge thing that gave me a lot of pause. Like I was nervous for all the athletes and the staff and all the people who were going to be risking their health in order to put on sports. But I was also, I, I'm still nervous about this projection of everything being okay, that you can look like, people will look to the NFL starting as like an indication that things are okay now and that they can then, I worry, make reckless decisions and in the end will actually harm the, these communities. And so, I don't know, I'm rambling now. That's a really good question. I knew you're going to be really good at this. My I have question, to think about it a little more. I mean, my, my question is normalcy for whom? Like, like, normal, like what does normalcy look like for the people who are asking for sports to come back? Um, because normalcy for you know, poor communities and for black and brown communities and for, you know, at this point, certain regional communities in the country that are still being devastated by this virus is not what normalcy is going to look like even if football is back, right? Like, so I feel like it it, it is really um, indicative of the groups of people that are capable of using sports as escapism, because that's not everybody. And listen, I love sports. I really do. And I do also, I have used them as escapism from, you know, family troubles and, you know, school troubles, all kinds of things. Like, you know, like the Yankees, not right now, have gotten me through some of, honestly, (laughs) some of the not right now, but some of the darkest personal years that I have ever had in my life. And that is a real thing. Um, And and I I, I will say that I, I have talked to, you know, when this pandemic started, I, I'm from New York City, and all of my friends basically are in New York City. And I talked to a lot of them, you know, and I talked to them, I, I talked to my friends basically twice a week. We had regular Zooms, and I, I knew a lot of people who died, and I knew a lot of people who lost loved ones. And when baseball started to talk about coming back, we all had the same concerns and the same reservations. And I probably had them more heightened than anybody else, but I heard from people who had been living among this in a, in a much more concentrated way than frankly, the rest of the country had at that time. And, and I heard from people that I love and who were smart about this thing. And and some of whom work in the medical field who said, I know, I know this doesn't make sense intellectually, but it would make me feel more normal if I could watch the Mets on TV or the Yankee, you know, and, and I don't really know what to do with that. I don't know how to tell that person that they're wrong because are, like, I mean, are they like, they know that if they were the person, if they were in charge, if they were running the government, they knew that they would be, that they would be wrong if they were like bringing these things back in an unsafe way. But as a fan, you know, I, I think, you know, one of the things that we've learned in, in writing this book is to try and be less judgmental about that because it is such a, such a human response and, and a human response in a time of such heightened crisis. So it, it is a really hard question. I don't think there is an answer for it. Hmm. That makes me wonder if there is a lot of memory attached. Like when I watch tennis, it's not just that I'm watching that tennis match. Of course it's that, but it's tied into like decades of deep love and excitement around this thing. So I wonder if that there's this memory attachment, this emotional memory. Oh, a hundred percent. And I hate making this comparison. I don't think that I've done this on any of the interviews that we've done 
because 9-11 is used as such a, a propaganda tool and, and by people who weren't there, which is like, it's a really big sore point to New Yorkers, frankly. Like I went to high school um, three blocks away from ground zero. Like it just, it just doesn't affect other people the way that it affected us. And it doesn't affect me the way that it affected people who were there. But the Yankees being in the World Series in 2001 was actually so meaningful to the city and, and to New Yorkers, even if you were a Mets fan. It was the first time that we really saw um, people putting aside different fandoms. And, and it's the first time I ever saw a Red Sox fan root for the Yankees, I'm just going to say. Um, but, but that was real. And that has been co-opted and used for propaganda since then. But I think of that often when we're asked these questions now, because I do remember what that feeling was like to have that at the time. And, and to be able to give that to people now, I, I, I do understand where that desire comes from. And like the Saints uh, winning Super Bowl, post Katrina. Totally. Oh, yeah. um, so my, hopefully people who are listening can't hear my neighbors doing evening yard work because in Columbus there have been storms and I think he's trying to get it all away. Anyway, there's also something interesting about, because in Columbus too, and I feel like folks here know this, I know people and love people dearly who knew in their hearts that OSU should not come back and play football, right? But also these people are like fifth generation Ohio State. And so it's like a connection to family. And okay. so I'm interested to talk about, um, I don't want to meander too much around the idea of fandom, but this idea of fandom that the lie of sports is a connecting tool, um, I, which I think starts as an athlete. I grew up as an athlete and I had coaches who like convinced us of the lie that like you know it's like the person look at the person next to you and this person will run through a wall for you and it's like well you know i'm like 13 so probably not <laughs> but um why do you think that trick works so well mm. well in some part there are like there is a reality to it there is a community in it right uh or there is a generational connection I used to watch college football a lot. I was a huge Florida State fan. That's where I went to school, but that's where my parents went to school. And I've given it up over the last five to seven years for a whole host of reasons. And I remember when I realized that I couldn't do the small talk anymore with the people in my life that I used to be able to have those kind of conversations with. And feeling sad about that, even though I was okay with the choice that I had made for the reasons that I had made it. Um, and I still sort of feel that way years into it. So I do think there's a real, there is a community aspect to it that means a lot. Like, I mean, when I watch tennis, I not only has my sweet family learned to watch tennis alongside me so that they can participate with me, um, my thing I always say about it is that's the most romantic thing my husband's ever done is learn how to watch tennis with me. And, but I tweet a lot about it, right? Because there's a, this, I'm in a community at that moment online and I love the tennis Twitter community. And so that's, that's real stuff there. So I think people are holding on to something real at the same time. When you said that Hanif, it made me think about when I was in middle school basketball and they used to make us do the thing where you sit on the wall right? So you're not actually sitting, but you're just, your back's on the wall and it's terrible. You're like 12 and dying. And the, and the way they get you to do it is tell you that like, everyone will have to do it again if you fail. Like the, the, this is a, we're all in this together. The pain that you as a child are experiencing is worth it because we're doing this as a team. Like that's deeply ingrained. And I think a lot of bad stuff happens in sport because of it, yeah. right? We could go on and on about abusive systems within sport that definitely are related to those ideas. So I don't know. I do think there's something real that those things are tapping into at the same time they're exploited in ways that are really bad. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. I think that it just, it comes from, it, it it comes from the fact that there is some truth to it. Like there is, you know, Jessica and I found each other because on Twitter, because we found communities of like-minded women and, and fans of, of women's sports and, and women who love sports and things like that. And, you know, one of, I, one of the earliest ways that I became a sports fan and, and one of the, the strongest connections that I have to my sports is that it's a representation of me as both a New Yorker of me in my hometown and where I grew up, but also me as an American. And at the same time, the fact that I look like I do, I'm an Indian American daughter of immigrant woman from New York City, 
is used against me to deny my sports fandom, right? So, so I think that there is a grain of truth to it that, like, like Jessica said, gets exploited. Um, I think even hearing, I will suggest it's great to even hear those, the word abusive laid up against this idea of um, the things. Because I, I was thinking recently about, you know, I played sports in most of my life from young age to cut through college and thinking about like some of the stuff that I had to, you know, in high school, if, uh, if, a, if a teammate missed soccer practice, we would have to like run to their house no matter where they lived. That was just like what we had to do. And, uh, you know, in the moment it's like, well, this is like, remember the Titans where they're at Gettysburg, you know, that old bullshit. Um, but it's really like, this isn't the move. You know what I mean? Like maybe this, yeah. maybe we should be asking kids to like run on the highway. You know what I mean? Um, so I, there are two chapters that I wanted to talk about, especially because, um, you know, I've been so eager to talk to y'all about the mascots chapter because mm-hmm. um, I, I know we were talking in the beginning about how this book arrived in a world that it wasn't written in as, as all books do. But um, of course, the mascot chapter kind of centers on the Washington football team, which is now literally called the Washington football team. <laughs> um, and um you know, for me personally, I thought once we, my, my mode of thinking was always, okay, once we get Washington, like once we get over that hump, it'll be kind of like a, a waterfall of, uh, not to sound hmm. like Cat Stevens or but like a waterfall of change type of thing, right? Um, where, you know, I'm in Ohio, Cleveland's baseball team probably has made these like incremental adjustments and then every few years they're like, well, we're going to think on a team name and then they think on it, but then they come back and it's the same team name. And so what, um, if not, not that it is on y'all to answer this, but just as a speculative type of thing, if not now, then when for these kind of like large sweeping and not just in professional sports either, just like down the line, I mean, high schools, it's really prevalent everywhere. And so kind of like, if not now, when is this going to maybe make some, you know, larger moves? That's so interesting because, yeah, so the chapter is written before they changed their name, right? And we were shocked. I mean, I was genuinely shocked when they changed the name. I think we ended the chapter by saying, we'll see if that ever happens. Uh, Very skeptically to the fact that it probably never actually happened. Um, But... Yeah. So on some level, I do see what you're saying that there would be a cascade and the other teams would feel the pressure. And there was some of that, right? Those teams were definitely asked questions about it at the time and they hedged in the way that they always hedge. Uh, At the same time, there is a part of me that understands that this was the big one, right? Like the R word is a slur. It's obvious maybe in a way that the other ones are harder to not necessarily for us, but it's a, harder argument. There's the, the idea that they're honoring someone. It's easier to make that argument to people who want to hear it. Uh, so on some level, not being the R word makes you look good, if that makes sense. So I can see how those teams being like, well, we weren't a slur. So we're doing okay. If you were a slur, you should have to change it. And I will say, I think it was the Illuminatives account tweeted not long after they changed the name that there are something like 80 three schools, high schools in America that still have that name as their mascot. So it's certainly still an issue. Like that exact word as a mascot is still an issue throughout the country. But, you know, the whole chapter argues that native mascots have to go um, from top to bottom. But I do think it reminds me of when I worked on Baylor around sexual assault and their football program. And I do feel like there are a lot of programs that are like, well, we're not them. So like, <laughs> you know, like yeah. the bar to, to what is unacceptable was set really high. So now like now the bar is like, you're the slur. And if you're under the bar, then at least you're not that. So I can see how that would work against the change actually um, cascading down. Yeah. And I'm just going to keep pointing out whenever someone asks us about this, that it was not a small thing that FedEx 
played a part in this, um, that there was money at stake. You know, Dan Snyder didn't just like suddenly have a come to Jesus moment and decide to do this out of the goodness of his heart. Like this was forced in, in every way possible. You'd have to um, believe there was goodness in his heart. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> to, like, fully well, and, and anyway, <laughs> there, there, there's a lot of other things going on around Dan Snyder right now also that we should continue to yeah. pay attention to. Right. Um, so it's a confluence of all of these things, but I will say also, like I have definitely had so many moments in the last five years where I have thought, if not now, when, and in the last six months had the when be answered, you know, when we all, I think it was actually five years ago, right. And it was 2015 when we were having the Confederate flag debate in the, in the Capitol building in South Carolina. And that's when we thought it would be finally banned from NASCAR. It would finally be, you know, this thing that we had to stop talking about. And, and it again, took five years. It took the killing of George Floyd. It took this mass uprising in a way that we haven't seen in recent years, at least, and, and galvanized. But it also took players with like threatening to withhold playing for their college teams and, and all kinds of things coming down in order to, to, to do this. And, and NASCAR did finally actually make that decision. So I, I, tend to veer on the very cynical of, yeah, I mean, if, if Washington can do it, why can't Kansas City get rid of the chant? And why can't Cleveland change their name? And why can't we get rid of the Tomahawk Chop in Atlanta? And you can go down the line, you know, you can way past professional sports, obviously. But I do think that, you know, as Jessica said, the big one is always the biggest one to overcome, even if it does kind of create that barrier for what the next one will be. Um. And I, I wanted to talk very specifically about women's basketball and for a couple of reasons. One, so I was on, on Twitter, there was, you know, someone was passing around one of those, like, who's the best athlete you've ever seen in person type of things that comes up every few months. Uh, and for me, like, I, you know, I saw LeBron James very up close in high school, so I, I don't think it's ever fair for me to really answer. But I was also thinking about Katie Smith, who... Back in the day, Columbus, I, y'all probably know this maybe, but Columbus had like a semi-pro women, like pre-WNBA, there was like, you know, a league and the Columbus Quest were in it. And we had a very young Katie Smith who was just like un- unreal, unstoppable. And that was kind of like my first live exposure mm-hmm. to basketball was seeing the Columbus Quest play. And, um, and I think having that had kind of already like built excitement around the WNBA for me and... I love Ticha Penichero coming up because she was like flashy uh, in ways that I aspired to be flashy. You know, there's a point where like her and Jason Williams were both in Sacramento playing point guard and it was like, no look passes all the time, you know, that, that type shit. But I think we're at a point now, or it feels like we're at a point now um, where women's basketball, specifically the WNBA, but I think even in college, you know, I, I lived in Connecticut for uh, when, when, you know, Brianna Stewart was at UConn, and that was just, like, a wild time. People were coming from everywhere, like, minds of cars, you know. And it, it just, it occurs to me that, like, we're maybe at a time uh, for specifically women's basketball, WNBA in, in college, um, where the excitement feels like it is reaching a fever pitch, not just... Um, you know, when I was coming up, it was very much like marketed to young women in specific. I remember that. I remember feeling like, well, you know, like, I mean, a couple of my friends like it too, you know, but now it feels like it's just like, this is basketball, it's good, and you're going to like it. And also there are personalities associated with these games that you've got to really pay attention to. Um, where did you feel like a turning point hit for, for women's basketball in the States? And where do you see it going from, from where yeah. it is? I know you kind of touched on this in the book, but would love to hear you expand on it. Yeah, that's a great question. I also, Atlanta had a team in one of those pre-WNBA leagues, and I can't remember, I remember seeing Teresa Edwards play. My mom lived in Atlanta when I was young, uh, and she was wonderful. And I was lucky, we can talk about the Olympics at some point if you want, but I was lucky in 1996, and my uh, mom got tickets to see the women play ball, and I actually wrote about this uh, whenever for the New York Times Magazine about what that meant to me as a 15 year old who was too tall and never, didn't fit in my body right, felt really uncomfortable. And then to go and see Lisa Leslie lead that team in person, just, oh, like even now I get emotional just thinking about like what that meant to me. 
at, at that age. So, you know, it's been important. I've played middle school basketball. Like I was deeply, I, I used to have like this giant book of photographs and I, my parents probably still have it. Um, that was just like women's basketball. And I remember like just flipping through it and looking at these pictures of these women. Um, but yeah, I do feel, I mean, the WNBA is, I should look this up, Kavitha, because now this is like the second time that I'm guessing. It's like, what, 23 years old now? Right. Okay, well, don't make me do math. That'd be 22. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what year is it? Uh, like, it's been around for a long time now. But I agree, Hanif, there's something in the last, I would even say in the last five years where there is a different momentum, I think, in women's sports in general, but the WNBA in particular. And I mean, I don't know if it's just that who's in charge of the league has changed their the marketing, like you said, is much more inclusive in a way of their own imagining of who the fan is and, and what the fan can be. And it just, it's so hard to pinpoint because I think for the last five, six years, every year has felt like, oh, this is new. There's more excitement. Like, here we are. We're going, we're going. And even this year, I was nervous. Of, I mean, I was nervous in general for what would happen to women's sports in this moment in time. And the W has still... I mean, the product is phenomenal, and I think maybe that's part of it too, is that it just, it's the toughest professional league to get a job in because there's only 12 teams and the teams are only so big, and you have to be spectacular even to ride the bench in the W. And so the product itself is wonderful. And, and so I don't know. I feel like it's all of that together. Like they're getting much smarter at how they're marketing it. It's, the game itself is just forever getting better as we go um yeah and maybe it is you know social media probably helps that there are, were more informal channels through which people could find each other that were fans and spread information and you know gifts GIFs, i think it also it also reach the brands right like it's really it's i i talk about this a lot it it's so difficult to tell men who make decisions in marketing and programming roles not to do something the way they've always known to do it, the way that it's always worked, kind of that includes including demographics and including viewers and fans that you don't always market to, you don't always think of. And I think we started to see this in earnest. I want to say 2016 or 2017, because I remember I was at ESPN when they when ESPN released a schedule, it's WNBA schedule, and they were there were primetime games. Like, and most of the schedule was in prime time and not at like 2 p.m. on a Tuesday or like a Saturday when nobody could find them. I remember that happening. And it was around the same time that you started to see major, you started to see Nike, but you also started to see Under Armour, especially really start to market to women, but not in a condescending way, in a like women work out and women are athletes, even when they're not professional athletes. And we should be hiring not only women to do the ads, but women to design the products for them because, you know, not everything should be pink and, and all of that. So I really, I really do think that, that those kinds of shifts happen together and they don't happen organically. They happen when, um, when you keep kind of beating that drum and when when the consumer, when the fans can actually reach the people who are making those decisions, but they don't happen they don't they don't actually like accurately follow the trend because if you're if you are saying that they accurately follow the trend you're saying there only have been women athletes and there have only been women consumers of sports for 5 years now that's absolutely that's ab that's obviously and absolutely not true um but i do think it was it, it has been something that um has changed as we've seen leadership change right as we've seen people who are making these decisions not just be men at the top I'm also wondering, because for a long time, there's so much stigma around the W, and this is still true. I'm not saying that this is fixed. Around, you know, There's a lot of homophobia around the W. Uh, we always talk about the three. They're up against sexism, racism, and homophobia. And I'm wondering, as that has fallen away a little bit, if it's easier to be fan. Like, I, I wonder, just in general, over the last five years, if we're just seeing stigma around these things falling away a little bit, that it's becoming easier to be a fan, to convince marketers that it's not uh, the worst thing in the world to appeal to the people who like watching the W. I don't know. 
it also seems like, at least for me, there's been kind of like a flexibility and freedom around political expression. Um, oh, yeah. In the W, you know what I mean? And also just like the stakes that are, I think about Maya Moore all the time, you know, like the, 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 like, the amount of stakes that it required for her to walk away from the game. Um, and I don't want to get into the, like, would an NBA player ever do this? I, I don't, I just think it's, but I do think that the, um, in, a, in a, a lot of ways, it has felt for me at least, as someone who is politically invested and loves basketball, um, the W's kind of really led, led the way in this, like, what feels like a newer era of uh, athlete protest, which isn't to say athletes didn't protest before, but, like, using everything at your disposal, be it social media, you know, and, and, and having the power over. Yeah, yeah, it seems like they're, they're leading away there. Well, well, Jessica says this often. Um, in a lot of ways, and this doesn't take anything away from Maya Moore, but in a lot of ways, just the mere act of being a women's basketball fan, let alone a women's basketball player, is a radical act in itself. It's not something that comes lightly, right? It's not something that's easy to do even when you're just doing your job. So in, in that way, I would say WNBA players are already in some ways predisposed to be able to make those decisions and to and to take those those steps and then when you get to someone like Maya Moore who took not one but two seasons off of a hall of fame career to fight for the exoneration of a wrongfully convicted black man um and and the way that these women have been at the forefront of this movement and not getting the credit for it um un until people pointed out that they should be getting the credit for it <laughs> is really a microcosm of how black women have always been um, at the forefront of civil rights movements and and LGBTQ movements and 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 everything like that. So I mean, it's it's you know there, our our country has always kind of been built on the labor of of, of black women and of the people that we've never given credit for uh, credit to. And and there's no reason that sports would be any different than that, right? Yeah, right. and you think about the. middle that um the nba players even though they still don't they're not in the middle they're not the center where the power is they're definitely outside of it they're so much closer than the women are in lots of ways and so it's not that it, it's easier then to do these very brave things that they do but i do wonder if that makes it easier for them to navigate that there's no real chance that they're suddenly going to show up in the in the center of power Right. Um, so I'm glad you brought up the 96 Olympics. You know, we got, we got that great documentary on the dream team. Um, but I would love a documentary on that 96 team, 96 women's team. That me was too. really like, a, like an awakening for me when it came to, like that team was just loaded, you know? And of course, like, you know, other teams have, have also been, you know, it's like American sports. Other teams are also equally loaded, but I feel like that one was like real. Um, it feels like, some of this is a failure of the American imagination, but I feel like they play, there are landmarks placed uh, along um, kind of like groundbreaking moments for women's sports, be it that World Cup team or the 96 women's Olympic team. I don't know. But um, one thing I wanted to, to talk about, so I stopped watching football. And I know, like, Jessica, you have as well. Um, and Kavita, I'm not, have you stopped watching football as well? Are you out on football? I haven't. I actually have a fantasy football draft later tonight. Um, <laughs> I, 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 would, I, I would say of the, it's the first time I've played fantasy football in quite a while, actually, but I will say of the sports um, that I lean, that, that I historically have loved, football is the hardest one for me to watch. It's the one that I've, I've, I wouldn't say I've stopped watching it, but, and I also just can't for my job, but it's the one that I watch the least. And I'm including like, I don't know. I'm trying not to denigrate hockey because I actually really love hockey, but I'm including every sport when I say that I prob I watched football the least of all the sports, which is 
difficult because it's ubiquitous, right? It's everywhere if you're a yeah. sports fan, let alone a sports writer. Yeah, I mean, I, um, I giving up on the NFL, I, I gave up on the NFL in 2015, and I, you know, I mean, I live in Columbus, Ohio, and so giving up on college football is kind of like uh, you have one foot in the door, even if you don't want that foot in the door, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. Just because it's, you know, um, but I'm, I'm interested in so often a thing that I've struggled with, and I struggle with this in pop culture too, with my other work, quote unquote, as a critic of things, is that people so often frame divesting from anything or abstaining from anything as a, as a, as a series of righteous decisions. And for me, it is most often a series of anguish decisions, you know, because to abstain from football meant that I was removing myself or was dislocating myself from hmm. a lot of warmth, a lot of small talk, as Jessica mentioned earlier, a lot of connection with people. You know, my brother played college football. Like these are, you know, people I love that I can no longer connect with on a level. And to me, you know, it just doesn't feel like this righteous thing that I can then hold over people. And I think that framing it as righteous gets this shit. Get the, sorry for cursing, Eric. If you're like behind the two dollar radio thing, like damn, he's cursing again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, framing it as righteous, you get this shit that's like this binary that presents the NBA as the, the righteous league and the NFL as the league of degenerates. So I'm I'm curious to hear you both talk about at the center of this book, working through loving sports when you don't feel like the love comes back to you and how do you have you found yourself if you have how do you find yourself kind of gradually divesting um and replenishing through that divestment well i'm going to jump in on the on the righteousness part in particular and say you know like i said before that it, it i'm an i'm a really opinionated and really judgmental person um and i apply that to myself i'm extremely hard on myself as well and like I said before, one of the things that I that that we both learned in this book was to try and not be as judgmental of people. So I don't think that there's a righteousness to, to the decision to stop watching football. The fans that we interviewed who did say that they had stopped watching, whether it was football or another sport, did it out of self-preservation, did it out of, you know, not wanting to confront that anguish. And that is completely fine. That is a totally acceptable response to the dilemmas that we that we explore in this book. At the same time, I do think that it's it's alienating and it's um, I don't know. I mean, it's 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 moral it's morally relativistic, frankly, to be placing that righteousness on other fans who haven't made that similar decision. Because where do you draw that line? This is the question that I always ask. Like, what have we? How do we decide where that line is drawn? On the one hand, I have said in every interview that we've done that. Every, almost every issue that we discuss in the book is something that I do really truly think is fixable. It's just really hard to fix these things. But I do think that we can fix systemic racism and homophobia and some of the things that we fix here. We cannot make football safe. There is just no such thing as safe fo- as safe football. So that is that's the one you know, that's the one line that I will draw between football and and the other sports and the other dilemmas that that we outline here. But if you're talking about, you know, you as as also also writing about pop culture, how do we decide what is cancelable for a broader society? We can only make those decisions for ourselves, right? And I'm always saying that, you know, the arbiters of the culture that are worth keeping around despite the things that we find objectionable are always going to are all are at this point you know higher class wealthy educated mostly white you know that kind of thing there is a reason that michael jackson is canceled and jackson pollock is not so i i i take a little bit of issue when you know, when people do try to say that, well, how can you even, how can you stand to watch football anymore because this and this and this happened? That's absolutely fair. We lay out how those, all those things happen in the book, but all of those things are, or similar things are happening, not just in basketball and hockey and tennis and golf. And, you know, we can go up the upper echelons of what the sports are, but all these things are happening in music. They're happening in rap as much as they're happening in opera. The conductor of the New York Philharmonic had to relinquish his post a few years ago because of the Me Too movement, you know? And and I just think that the people who are making the decisions about what culture is worth um, withstanding these objections that we have never do it um, on, a, on a consistent basis outside of who is consuming these things. 
I really like anguish versus righteousness because it is totally anguish, isn't it? Like there's sometimes I feel righteous about my decisions, but most of the time I do just feel deeply conflicted. And I think one way that I can tell is I don't really want to talk to people about it all the time. Like I don't want to have to justify or explain myself because there is a lot of hurt involved in, in making these choices. And there is no right one. Sometimes, sometimes there's a right one, but like most of the time there is no actual right answer. So I don't know how to deal with it is like its own beast. I think sometimes I just feel bad about it while I'm still watching. Sometimes I think that the joy that I get out of the sport is just over, you know, it like the balance, uh, it tips the scales in, in that favor, but it's not that I'm not feeling those things too. I, I always joke that I don't actually want to know anything about tennis, but the truth is that I know a ton about tennis. We wrote a whole chapter on all the things that are wrong with tennis. And it's not a surprise to anyone that I deeply love the Williams sisters. And they are just, you know, you, you can't take in tennis without understanding. I'll, I'll curse alongside you, honey, with all the shit that they've had to go through in order just to be standing on that court today. So I don't know. I do think it's just like a balancing act for each moment. And for me with college football, it just got to the point where I mainly just felt really bad. (laughs) And so as I was watching it, I also just have this really sad encyclopedia in my head of specifically coaches because they're the ones who are still around who've been in charge of programs that have had issues around gendered violence. So I'm like really unfun to watch college football with because I'm just there to point out then I get righteous. <laughs> I think <laughs> maybe when I get righteous is when I know I should stop <laughs> watching something. Um, okay. Because I, I do have, I have other stuff I'm going to restrain myself because um, for the sake of people asking questions. So you can ask questions in the little Q and a box and I'm going to look at them. And if they're bad, I won't. I'm not gonna <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> ask them, but you can put them in there. Uh, um, oh, the first question is kind of one we just went over. So mm-hmm. sorry. Uh, but any other questions, put in the little Q&A box um, and I'll, I'll take a peek. Um, I will say that you, you all should buy the book if you haven't already. And if you have, grab it for a friend. It's been really interesting for me to read and revisit. Because I read it when I blurred it and then I reread it um, leading up to this and it's been really interesting to revisit in a time where I'm feeling very weird about sports watching Um, in a time when I like want to feel good about sports watching um, but I'm still feeling very detached from I don't know there was that like Mavericks Clippers game where Luca hit the deep game winning three and that was like very much the first time where I was like oh wow I feel excited about a sports thing (laughs) but then they interviewed him and I was like oh no they're just in like in a bubble in Disney and I can just see it all (laughs) (laughs) Uh, there was something about the nwsl where it was like i don't know it felt very distant this is a good question are there any sports movies that you either love or hate Mm. we're always gonna say a league of their own it's just like it's just a thing like it's one of it's just one of the greatest movies of all time it's one of those that like with shawshank redemption like every time it comes on the tv it doesn't matter where in the movie it is i'm just gonna end up watching it um movies that sports movies that i hate is are, is much more fun to go through <laughs> um uh, i'm not a huge sports movie person actually but i will tell you that when i was in like high school i feel like my family must have had a subscription to hbo and i they had a subscription to some movie channel and blue chips with Shaquille O'Neal and Anthony Hardaway, and I lived in Central Florida, and so I was a massive Orlando Magic fan at that time. And was it Nick Nolte was the coach yeah. of the team? And I, I think I've seen that movie like fifty to sixty times. I couldn't really tell you what it's about today. I don't have a good grasp, but I remember being absolutely obsessed with it. If it's total garbage, no one tell me because my memories of it uh, are very starry in my head. Every good '90s kid also loves loves the Sandlot. So. Oh yeah, yeah. I was a big Sandlot person. Jessica, have you seen the documentary, the Thirty for Thirty, about the Magic 
where they talk I about have, where they talk about like Shaq and Penny meeting on the set of blue chips and them like playing that real live scrimmage and Shaq being like, We gotta draft this guy. No, but I'm gonna go watch it now. Did it's, they talk about Nick Anderson missing his fourth free free throws? They do. That I, oh, <laughs> I think we were when I was watching I don't know, because I don't care enough about the NBA. One of the games, and it was someone stepped up to the line at the end to hit a free throw, and I was like, oh, I still have a lot of trauma <laughs> for Nick yeah. Anderson. Like, how does that man move through the world, having that inside of him? But, yeah, no, I haven't seen that, so I'll have to go, I'll have to go watch it. Um, someone is asking for your thoughts on the reaction from the Djokovic incident versus Serena's. I'm not sure which Serena's, which Serena incident, but Jessica, you might know, or Kavita, you might know. Well, I, so... I think that this is part of, of why I, Jessica and I both texted when this happened. Um, <laughs> and we, we were both uh, equally smug about this happening. Um, I think that not knowing which Serena incident you're comparing it to is actually a big problem because they, they, were, they were similar but different. Um, and it does actually matter how you're comparing them. Listen, I think that most of us can agree that Djokovic did not mean to hit this woman, this lines person in the throat with a ball, but he did out of anger in a tantrum that isn't the first time that he has displayed this kind of behavior on the court and has gotten away with it. And every time Serena is penalized for something or even not penalized, like the two incidents that we can talk about in the, in the 09 U S open and, and I can't a couple of years ago against Naomi Osaka um, also in the U S open. Um, uh, both both of those are extreme are extreme examples, but this kind of conversation comes up whenever Serena's on the court about her her on court, her etiquette, and she's just not as graceful or as classy as as Venus. Which is interesting that people like to bring up Venus as the comparison because it it makes them feel okay that they're comparing a black woman to another black woman. But what they're really saying is that Serena is the angry black woman on the court, and I I feel like. You know, when we see men like Djokovic get away with abusing lines people outside of this incident, right, which has happened so many times, he is not a quiet person on the court, right? Um, but it, it all comes back to this extremely Victorian ideal of etiquette and, pol and politeness and polity that tennis is built on um, that has for decades denied the Williams sisters and Serena in particular, the rightful places at the top of this sport. Um, you know, I talked earlier about how sports has always made me feel more connected to my American identity, but has also always been used to deny my own Americanness, even though I was born here and all of that. But, um, Serena and Venus are the only, are, are two of the only people who have dominated their sport in, and, and and still the racism supersedes the nationalism. We still can't get certain white tennis fans to root for them. So when it, when when I see something like like this, that like what happened with the Djokovic thing, I mean, yes, I also just like very much dislike this person um, about his stances on equal pay and um, you know the way that he just held a whole ass party, excuse me, um, at the beginning of the summer amid COVID and just literally was the source of a lot of COVID spread here. Um, but I do think that it is a little bit of karma, a little bit of comeuppance and a little bit of just a slight course correct for what someone like Serena has had to deal with her entire career. And can you imagine, I'm sorry, just can you imagine if Serena had accidentally, even accidentally, hit a lines person in the throat with a tennis ball, she would literally be banned from the sport. So yeah, I, I think that, I don't think it was an overreaction. I don't think it was a disservice to tennis, as some other pundits have said. And uh, clearly I have thoughts on that. Jessica? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a Djokovic fan. Um, I did hear two tennis reporters that I respect a lot talk about how he's a very good loser uh, that they like, that he actually tends to be one of the better losers on tour. It helps he doesn't lose a lot, probably. Um, but that he's pretty gracious in those moments. And But I think he um, definitely is a jerk in, in a lot of ways. And uh, But doesn't get this sort of, you know, like, who was it? John McEnroe, which we could talk all day about John McEnroe. But I think he was saying, like, this is going to stick to Novak. And, you know, this will follow him around. And I was like, no, it literally won't. Like, no one will care in the next turn. It'll be like the redemption of Novak Djokovic. Can he overcome? Whereas, you know, Serena, we are still talking about 
the US Open from 11 years ago or whenever. I mean, they changed how they do line judging because of Serena, because she was right to be angry, right? Like, um, so I, I mean, I was a little bit smug about it because I'm not a fan of his, but that's so funny, Kavitha, you talking about like the like idea of tennis and the prudishness of the sport, the conservatism that's baked into it. Uh, I was just saying to my husband last night, the Azarenka, she's playing right now, I believe, for to see if she's going to get into the semi. And I told him that I was going to root for her and that I always have and in large parts because she's really loud. And there are people who and have all reasons for not liking it. But I love the women who scream when they're on court because they just piss so many people off. And there's a part of me that finds that attractive in some way where I just want to root for them. I rooted for Sharapova when she was out there yelling um, because it's going directly against what tennis is supposed to be. So yeah, I mean, Kavitha is hundred percent right. If Serena had hit someone in the throat, it would be like a month long discussion and we'd have to talk about it every single year, every time, every single I'm, time. I'm not even exaggerating. I'm not sure if she wouldn't have been arrested. We have seen arrests on courts. I'm not, I'm not actually exaggerating. <laughs> like, um, also to your point, Jessica, with the, with the grunting, I can't, I can't remember who the player is, but our Blue Jays reporter at The Athletic, Caitlin McGrath, um, who is also a huge tennis fan, texted me recently that a Blue Jays pitcher grunts when he throws a pitch because it's a, a tactic that he picked up from women tennis players that he appreciates. So, yeah. All right, so one more. Uh, we're running up on time, and I, I want to make sure that y'all can get to your evenings. Um, who are the athletes you're most excited to follow over the next few years in terms of their work as activists? Hmm, that's a great question. Oh, boy. I mean, I think the W is obviously the place to look first. I'm a huge Laisha Clarendon fan. Um, they play but, – oh, can I get on? They were on the Atlanta Dream before. So in my head, um, I was fortunate to sit on a panel with them a few years ago, but they've been spectacular. Uh, Elizabeth Williams of the Dream, she is often pretty quiet, but we've seen her really step up. Uh, she's also just a phenomenal basketball player. I don't know. Let me, I mean, Naomi Osaka is fascinating to me. I, I just love everything. I love everything about her affect just in, in general. Uh, so then to see her, I really feel like we've watched her be activated and she had this great interview with Sarai McDonald and I bring it up all the time because I feel like this was really the, the turning point um, and what we've seen publicly with her. Uh, she talked to, I know Sarai was, it was the Australian Open, I want to say after the US Open. So I think she, that was the one she won uh, after she won the US Open against Serena. And Sarai had gone down to Australia and, and met with Naomi and, and they're talking about everything that happened after the U S open and Naomi starts crying at one point and her handlers basically are like, Oh, interview done. Like <laughs> we're not in Naomi's like, no, I want to talk about this. And she, for the first time, I believe it was the first time. And I sure it helped that Soraya was a black woman that she's confiding all this into. She, um, she said that seeing how people reacted to Serena in that moment was so hard that she knew that people were on her side because they were just so anti Serena and all the racism in that moment. And so I just think seeing her activation has been really fascinating. I think Coco Goff in the same way. I mean, what is she six? She's still 16, right? Um, tennis in general is such a fascinating space for players of color in this moment. So I think that I'll, I'm going to stop there. Um, yeah, I mean, adding to that, I would say the Ogumake sisters, because I mean, Shanae now has a, a huge platform at ESPN and, um, she's given before that she gave a, a really raw interview to, uh, to Marcus Thompson, um, at the athletic. I am not kidding when I say that LeBron is going to run for office and like, I just, I mean, I think that that's just a given, right? I mean, one of the things that has been so Like he's going to be Hanif Senator? Is that what you're, is that <laughs> what you're saying? Be, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I don't know how you feel about that, man, but he's going to run. Like it's, it's a thing. One of the things that has been so fascinating to me to watch with NBA and WNBA players is that you have 
the most exciting, I mean, they're the highest achieving players in their sport in the world, right? Um, but you have the most exciting players in the flashiest sport. I don't say flashy in a derogatory way. I say this with great enthusiasm. The flashiest sport and the, the, most, the, the most exciting players taking the most boring parts of our political system, like voter registration and gerrymandering and, and you know, uh, convicted felon's felon, rights. Yeah. felon's rights, disenfranchisement in Florida and things like that. The things that you will never see in a political ad, but absolutely have to change. You know, you have, you have NBA players talking about redlining and why, you know, they, they're, why certain suburbs don't exist for black people and why, um, you know, Damian Lillard, we did an episode of, of my show, The Lead, about Damian Lillard's family home and, and in Oakland and how his grandfather bought this house that has on the deed that they have on it that this was not to be sold to black people. Like you have these incredible players, again, these most exciting and dynamic players taking the most boring parts of our political system that need to be overhauled in order to enact actual broad change and making those things exciting. Like these are never things that we would ever have in a political ad, but these are things that NBA players are for, are making their fans pay attention to. And I think that that and WNBA players, and I think that that is so important to pay to, to, to see and to see where that grows. I'm really curious, like we have such a long line of athletes who have themselves been victims of police brutality, who speak about it so personally and so effectively, but also with the knowledge of the slight amount of privilege that they have just having the money and having the platform. Like when Masai Ujiri, who's not a player, obviously is the president of the Raptors, but when Masai Ujiri and, and, and one of his players, Fred Van Vliet talked about the incident where, you know, just after they had won, um, they had won the NBA finals. The fact that Masai Ujiri was able to put the amount of money behind taking on the cop who accused him of assault when like the video finally came out, it was very clear that the cop assaulted him and all of that. And he said, you know, among all of the, the now I'm going to curse, among all of the bullshit that he had to go through, Masai said, you know, I also recognize that most of most people who look like me in, in America cannot take this fight on. Um, against a cop who is who is crooked in this way, and I think it's going to be really impactful for for us to continue to see athletes not just putting a voice to these issues that we should have been paying attention to for decades now, but putting a real a real personal face to them to fans who probably would not have cared about these things if it weren't a player that they rooted for, and that's a real sad and, and damning indictment of race relations in this country, but it is also a fact, right? It is also like reality that there are a ton of NBA fans right now who care about Black Lives Matter, who care about Black lives because their favorite player is Black. So I'm excited to see where, where that goes from there and hopefully to see that translate to people caring about, yeah. Can I mention one more person? Now that I'm sitting here thinking, I want to mention C.R. King, who plays for the Utah um, NWSL team. She's a young black woman. She's a rookie. She only started in the Challenge Cup. And U.S. soccer is so fascinating to me because, as we saw last summer with the U.S. Women's National Team, talk about being beat, big P polit political. Um, and it was really amazing to watch all of that. But now we're in this moment, and Andre Carlyle wrote a great piece for all for nine last week about how quiet a lot of the white W and WSL players have been through all of this. And uh, C.R. King though, when there was all the racism around Deloy Hansen, she was very vocal almost immediately. And so, you know, she's really young and she's coming up in a soccer culture that doesn't deal well with race and racism uh, for all of the things that they do well politically. So I think she's someone that I will definitely be keeping an eye on. Um, can I slide in one more? Because this came in after I said one more, and I feel like this yeah. question is important. Um, what do you predict is a long arc for changing sports arguments around hormones and trans people in sports? Or what do you think it should or could be? Do you see it playing out differently for trans masculinity and trans feminine athletes? I, that one came in like right as I was asking the one I said that was the last <laughs> one, but I think I do think this one's yeah. important, and I wanted to get that one get that one asked before. Yeah. Before, before. Thanks for asking it. Cause just what was it yesterday? Then Castro yeah. Semenya Castor, lost her right. case yeah. uh, again. Um, and these are super complicated topics. This is a 
particularly difficult topic. I do think when we're talking about this issue, we are mainly talking about trans women because uh, those are the people that we imagine in our minds because of all of our um, sexism that they shouldn't be, that they are too good, right? That they, um, their well, advantage they will, is too much yeah, and too unnatural. Too much. And I don't know the answer. The, the issues here are so deep rooted and it's really operating women's sports in general have been denied so much for so long we're talking about scarcity right like they're always fighting for the little bit that they get and so they the entire atmosphere is like we gotta keep it to ourselves right in a way that is as we are seeing around athletes like castor Semenya and trans athletes who want to compete um that it's super harmful and so but you're all you're like you're going up against this like you know, centuries long scarcity thing that women's sports are up against. And I don't, I don't know how we're going to do it. I mean, I think the thing that gets me about Caster, and I think we have to just like, we should just be, we are lucky that we get to see these athletes competing. They should get to compete. And if they're great, then they're great. And why, why are these the athletes that were like, Oh, if you're great, you're a problem. Right. And it does matter that it's a lot of global north white people deciding things about global south black and brown people that matters but i do think that keep reiterating that like this is about athletic greatness and the fact that like this is the one place where we've decided that these people uh shouldn't be allowed to be great athletically is it's just so revealing and i'll just say <laughs> plenty of trans athletes compete and they're not winning anything. <laughs> they like, we have a narrative in our society, the one that people are willing to write about because of all the fee, all the, all the shit they get to tap right into. And they know it'll be a hot take and JK Rowling will care and blah, blah, blah. Is that um, only when they win, because then this is the example of like all women's sports are going to go to shit um, because all the, all these jackass men are going to suddenly pretend to be like all those narratives are gross as hell um but they're super compelling in this transphobic world that we live in and so you're up against that but i'll just say like there are plenty of trans athletes intersex athletes that compete and we never learn about them ever because they're not threatening anyone and so we have to i think those two we keep pushing that like athletic greatness is athletic greatness and that it's not that you're guaranteed a gold medal just because you're a trans woman competing. Maybe that will help. I know that Katrina Carcasis is a good friend of mine and she's done a ton of great work. She just co-wrote a book called T testosterone about all the myths that, you know, science, we tell lots of myths in science too. And just, she's trying to do the work on the science side of pointing out all the ways um, she's in this book. We interviewed her for loving sports. I could, obviously, I feel very passionate about this. It makes me very angry. Um, women's sports, Jen Doyle has a beautiful piece about women's sports and how it exists to disrupt. That it, in, its, in its infant, like that is the thing that women's sports does. And men's sports is the boring thing that has always existed. And women's sports has come along to blow that up. And the possibilities in women's sports are so much bigger than they'll ever be in men's sports. And we have to make room there for trans and intersex athletes because that is part of this long history of what women's sports does. I'm done. <laughs> and it, no, no. And it, and it, and it also, it also goes back to something that, that, that Jessica says often sports are made up, right? Like sports are just made up. So the lines around what is and isn't an acceptable hormone advantage, hormonal advantage Those are, are made so up. Arbitrary, arbitrary. They are so yeah. made up. Um, and it's really, it's extremely frustrating. I think you can hear the frustration in, in, in both of our voices that, um, that you have courts deciding this. So I think that the work that Jessica just pointed to on the science side of it, that will keep people just realizing that all of this stuff is, is made up. And especially uh, again, like the hormone balances are, are extremely made up is, is very important. But I will say that I have seen the caster ruling was was a little bit devastating to me. On the other hand, I think about a month ago, Idaho killed its trans um, registration and ban bill, which I was extremely surprised at. I was pretty convinced that that would pass. So I don't know, man. Like, I, I do think that, like, and I've said this before, I do think that our, our 
our children really are our future. I think that younger generations just have figured some of this shit out much, much better than we are. They know how to talk about this stuff. They, you know, they're watching Steven Universe. It's like, and I, I think that they really do have the language and the wherewithal to actually figure this stuff out in ways that we don't, and definitely our elders don't right now. So I think that we've just got to kind of wait for the next generation to take over. And I will say that Katie Barnes, who we also interviewed for this book and specifically for the chapter for LGBTQ+, um, that one thing that they remind me of all the time whenever we're talking about this is that we can have this discussion all we want about professional athletes and who competes in the Olympics. Like that is a tiny group of people, but we really need to do better as a society when it comes to youth sports and inclusion. And Katie has done remarkable work at ESPNW telling these stories and the ways that, that these things operate on the ground. Uh, so when you see these stories that are focused on one professional trans woman competing, you, you just have to resist that in some way and think about all these trans kids who just want to fucking run, you know, like they just want to like play soccer, like whatever the thing is. Uh, and they're the ones really being affected uh, by, by all of this. So I'm done. I'm really done now. <laughs> all right. Thank you both for, you know, letting me hang out and talk to you for a bit. This was really great. Thank you, Hanif. Uh, it's thank really you so much. been lovely. Yeah, I love the book and I hope it continues to be received as well as it deserves to be received. And um, I look forward to, to dropping in on a couple other events and, and hope they go well. And uh, y'all, you know, this has been wonderful. And everyone who kind of hung out with us while sports are going on, I hope you yes. go watch thank some you. sports <laughs> very differently now. Yeah, Shireen told me she was going to watch this tonight, even though the Toronto Raptors were playing, which was like a really big deal. That's so. very exciting. I was going to say everyone yeah. here is a little bit lucky that Serena played earlier in the afternoon. I felt, yes. <laughs> I was relieved when I saw the schedule. <laughs> cool. Thanks, y'all. I appreciate it very much. And thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Everyone have a good night. Yep. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good night.